Yes, this is Jason Church. I'm with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. We're a National Park Service Research Office located here on Northwestern campus in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And today we're going to talk about Uncle Tom's Cabin and the sort of mythology and urban legend that surrounds so to start off with at NCPTT, we started last summer, and it's continuing on uh, for the next year, we started a project doing 3D digital documentation of slave cabins and tenant farmer housing. Uh, so, so far we've documented nine here in the Cane River region, and very soon uh, we'll be continuing throughout Louisiana and then throughout the South and the Mid-Atlantic states. So by all means, um, I, I'll give you some information at the end of the talk. If you're interested, if you know of a standing slave cabin or tenant farmer housing uh, in your area, please uh, drop us an email and talk to us. We'd be happy to talk to you about it and possibly come out and do uh, 3D documentation of it. So in that project, as soon as we did a few uh, laser scans, like the one you see here, uh, we started posting them on social media. And immediately we got a lot of input and feedback from people but one of the things I kept seeing pop up was this question and here's a, a screen capture from Facebook from where the Her Cane River National Heritage Area had shared one of our posts and it said what happened to Uncle Tom's cabin are there any pictures of it my mother lived in the same village it was located off Cane River she said that people would come and take pictures of their families with the cabin and this is just one example we had several uh, questions that came up. What about Uncle Tom's cabin? Have you documented? Are you going to document Uncle Tom's cabin? And a few people commented jokingly, Uncle Tom's cabin is still safe between the pages and things like that. But I knew exactly what these questions were really about. And that is when I moved to Natchitoches 15 years ago, uh, I was told of the legend that Uncle Tom's cabin was originally located in Natchitoches and that the character uh, Simon Legree from the novel was actually from Natchitoches and that's the inspiration for it. So I got very curious. I wanted to find out is this true? Is there any basis uh, for these stories and where did they come from? So to start let's back up real quick and uh, just touch base on we're talking about Uncle Tom's Cabin the novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was originally published in 40 installments over 10 months in 1851. It was so popular that the publisher convinced her to put them all together and publish it in a book form in 1852. And that'll be an important date as we uh, sort of go along with the, with the PowerPoint. So the first year it sold 300,000 copies and by 1857 it had sold 2 million copies. Uh, so widely read. Um, there was some rumor that Lincoln himself said this is one of the um, things that fueled the Civil War. Uh, at any rate, a very, very popular novel and a very important story. It was the first time that was sort of um, Harry Beecher Stowe was trying to tell of all of the ills of slavery in this novel. Uh, everything from families getting ripped apart, children being sold, the cruelty, all of it was sort of wrapped up in this one novel. Uh, for the general public and a lot of people who who hadn't traveled to the South, really, this was their first exposure uh, to what slavery was really like. So where our presentation comes in is the urban legend. And that's going to start at the McAlpin Plantation. And the little red dot is where it was located, right along the Cane River. Uh, sometimes it's referred to Derry as Derry, Louisiana. Sometimes it's for, referred to as Chopin. Or Cloucheville, but it's it's down um, right off Highway One. All right, so myth champion number one. This is the first time that we see this in published form. In 1893, D. B. Corley of Abilene, Texas, uh, he wrote a book called A Visit to Uncle Tom's Cabin. So this is the first time I said uh, we're going to see this printed. Now, it could have existed before this, but not in a printed form. So that's sort of been lost. Uh, this is the first time we can get a concrete date. Um, Mr. Corley writes this book to prove that this particular cabin is Uncle Tom's cabin. 
So the book starts out, A visit to the old plantation in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana, where I know the original Uncle Tom's cabin was still standing. Now he gives us no backstory to this. This is literally how the book starts. I know the original Uncle Tom's cabin is still standing. We don't know how he knows this. There's no backstory. There's no preface to this book. Just bam, this is Uncle Tom's cabin. And this cabin is on what had been the McAlpine Plantation in 1890s. Uh, this is now the Chopin Plantation. Robert McAlpine has died. Uh, the Chopin family has bought the plantation and is running it currently at this time period. And this is who he talks to. So Corley leases the cabin. So there's a formal lease agreement that he's going to take this cabin and exhibit it at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, which he does. It's actually put up at the Libby Prison War Museum and is on display throughout uh, the entire World's Fair. And the original lease agreement is he is to bring it back to the Chopin Plantation. Uh, the boards are numbered. It's taken down professionally and crated. And it's supposed to be brought back and put back up. But unfortunately, it never returns. Now, there's several rumors that we find as to why it never returned. One story is it was just lost. Um, that it never quite made it back. That they don't know what happened to it. It was just lost in transit somewhere. So some train car mislabeled it and it ended up somewhere other than where it was uh, meant to end up. However, there's also rumors that it toured the country... Uh, after the World's Fair as a tourist attraction and then eventually was lost in that move and didn't return home. Either could be true. And there's also a rumor uh, that appears in print a few times that it was actually splintered and sold as souvenirs by Coralie to make money. This could be true as well. Uh, we don't really know, but at any rate, it never returns home. So this original quote-unquote cabin uh, goes to the World's Fair and is lost to history. So why this plantation? Why this cabin? So Robert McAlpine is supposedly, uh, in Coralie's book, this is the character that Simon Legree is based on. And as, if you remember from reading the book, or if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. Uh, Simon Legree is the evil plantation owner. He's the epitome of evil. Uh, he abuses his slaves, he beats them, and he, he kills them uh, sort of at at will in in the novel. So his plantation in the book is along the Red River. He was a northerner that had moved to the south, McAlpine. Uh, his plantation is along the Cane River, which is a tributary of the Red River, and he is a northern transplant who comes down to run this plantation. Both had a wide reputation for cruelty. So in Coralie's book, A Visit to Uncle Tom's Cabin, it is a collection of sworn affidavits um, as to McAlpin's cruelty, not only his cruelty, but uh, specific events as to why everyone thinks he's so cruel. There are former, sla former slaves of McAlpin's in the book who swear uh, to these things. There are uh, neighbors who swear to these things. And essentially, in modern times, we would consider him a serial killer. Um, just repeatedly, they talk about the multiple slaves that he beats to death, that he has hung, has burned. We're talking a psychopath. I mean, this, this is a person who would have been in today's society a serial killer. So definitely wide reputation for cruelty. And this is why a lot of people think um, that he was the character Simon Legree from the novel is based on. All right, so now we have myth champion number two, and this is Dr. S.H. Scruggs uh, of Cluchyville. His story, which is published several times, mostly uh, letters that he has written that are published in various uh, newspapers, he claims that in 1940, Harriet Beecher Stowe and party, uh, mostly ladies, visited the McAlpine Plantation. Now... It varies as to why they visited. Um, he himself has several stories behind why they visited. The first is that they were just traveling down south, traveling down the Red River, 
And when they got to this area, it became impassable, and they had to, to ford and stop for the night. And their host, uh, the plantation of Robert McAlpin, um, greeted them openly and said that they could stay with him. There's another version of the story that actually says that Stowe specifically came to visit McAlpin because they were cousins. Now, they could have been first cousins or distant cousins. That also varies in the stories. Um, actually, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, someone posted on Facebook um, that they, I was posting, asking questions about some of the, the buildings on the site, and someone posted, oh, right, I was just doing research down in Alexandria Library, and the librarians told me that Stowe based her book on uh, her cousin in Natchitoches that she came and stayed with. So that, that urban legend is still perpetuating. So that's still out there. So the story goes, uh, the party was kicked out of McAlpin's house. Um, one version of the story is they just overstayed their welcome. They were there too long. Another version that is repeated is that Harriet Beecher Stowe herself questioned McAlpin's treatment of his uh, his house servants, particularly uh, the ladies of the house that served him, and his questionable treatment of them. At any rate, the story goes, McAlpin kicks them out of the house, and they go to the neighbor of Dr. Scruggs, and they stay with him for several weeks on. Now, Scruggs' son and Scruggs himself both say that um, that Dr. Scruggs was probably who encouraged Stowe to write this novel about her adventures down here and about uh, McAlpin being Simon Legree, and that actually Scruggs um, had handwritten chapters of the book in his possession and a first edition signed copy of the book. However, in later stories when he's asked to produce these, uh, Dr. Scruggs says they've been lost. So we have we have no proof of these and we never see them. Uh, of course, we also wonder why uh, Stowe would have l left handwritten chapters of her book behind a book that she was still writing at the time. All right. So champion number three of the mythology is Lyle Saxon. So Lyle Saxon, publisher, reporter, he writes in the book Old Louisiana, published in 1929. So, you know, th this this urban legend has legs. It's now lived quite a while. He writes about the story of um, Harriet Beecher Stowe coming down and basing her character Simon Legree on Ro Robert McAlpin and his manservant, Uncle Tom. And one of the quotes from Old Louisiana is, men living in the Red River country made calculations and found that the description fitting the McAlpine plantation exactly. So what he's referring to is that locals basically have said, we've read Uncle Tom's Cabin and the description of the plantation is so exact, it can be nowhere else but the McAlpine plantation. So here is a period photograph of the McAlpine plantation. Now, this is not taking during McAlpin's time. He has already passed at this point, and this is being um, run and owned by the Chopin family at this point. But same structures and, and just a little bit later. But by this point, uh, the Texas Railroad has already bought a section of the land, as you can see, and ran the railroad right through the middle of it. But the large structure we see uh, on our left, that is Robert McAlpin's plantation home that's the big house and then the smaller two buildings there is some rumor that the smallest building you can see right under the tree is uncle tom's cabin that's not true we know because there are photographs in Coralie's book that have been transcribed to sketch and it is a log structure with vertical logs and that's a horizontal uh board structure so that's not it uh it's possible at this point, maybe uh, the building rumored to be Uncle Tom's Cabin is out of the photograph, or it could have already been taken off um, and, and taken to the World's Fair when these photographs were taken. They're, they're around that time period. 
Uh, we do see the large brick structure is another house, uh, probably slave tenants. Um, I mean, enslaved housing, or this could be uh, the summer kitchen. But let's focus right now on the main house. So we have, here's the big house, and this is the back side and one side of it. And what you can see, there's a little bit of a front porch. Um, you can barely see sort of the gap uh, for the front porch in, in the front of the house. So let's go back to her own words. Let's listen to what Harriet Beecher Stowe says about Simon Legree's home. And remember, this is the one that Lyle Saxon says is so fitting and so perfect. It could be no other structure but this one. So, in Harry Beecher Stowe's words, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, The house had been large and handsome. It was built in a manner common at the south. A wide veranda of two stories running around every part of the house, into which every outer door opened, the lower tier being supported by brick pillars. Alright, so we got the brick pillar part. Uh, We've got no two-story veranda running completely around the house. Uh, we don't have all the exterior doors opening onto a veranda. I would say this sounds more like most of the larger plantation homes you would find uh, farther down the Mississippi. Uh, this doesn't describe the structure at all, uh, other than it's supported by brick piers, which you know 90% of all the structures would have been at that time period. So that's one of the big questions with the myth is why this structure had to be so perfect by description. Now if we're also going with Stowe's words, um, here are two more myth busters we could say. Uh, first of all, she herself says she wrote the novel while at her home in Brunswick, Maine. So, so much for having written it uh, at Scruggs house in Cluchyville. And even in one of my uh, early editions of Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, there is an illustration of the house in Brunswick where the novel was written. Another thing that she says um, in, in a couple of articles that I found and in a biography um, that when she wrote the, before she wrote the book, she had only traveled as far south as Kentucky. So she had lived a little while in Ohio, and she had only gone as far south as Kentucky once before writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. So that also sort of throws the entire mythology that she herself was in Natchitoches uh, to meet McAlpin to base Simon Legree on him. So another question comes up. What about Meredith Calhoun? Um, so we find several times Meredith Calhoun's name coming up as the possible Simon Legree. So Meredith Calhoun also had a plantation along the Red River in what is now known as Colfax. He was also a northern transplant who had come down, also legendary for his cruelty. So Calhoun himself owned more than 700 slaves, and this isn't all at the same plantation. He had multiple so the Washington Post ran an article in 1896 calling Calhoun the model for Miss Stowe and saying that he was the epitome of Simon Legree um, because of his cruelty. Now the famed landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted came down in 1853 and he wrote about Calhoun's cruelty and almost beating a slave to death in his presence. Um, this actually, when Olmsted returned to the North, he became a staunch abolitionist after this. Uh, he was uh, horror struck by the way he saw slaves treated in the South. Uh, when he came back to the North, he really became a very outspoken person against slavery. Uh, and really, it changed his life and his view of it. And all that is thanks to Meredith Calhoun and his cruelty. Now, there are again... Uh, we find sworn affidavits from multiple people talking about uh, Calhoun's legendary cruelty, beating slaves to death, uh, that sort of thing. Well, what about Kentucky? So, in the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, of course, Tom dies in Simon Legree's plantation. 
Spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read it. I apologize. And that is here along the Red River. But of course, he also lived in New Orleans and in Kentucky. So there are several places in Kentucky who also claim to have the original Uncle Tom's Cabin. But let's drop back again to her words. And this is sort of uh, what's going to wrap up this, this whole mythology. So in 1852, now let's think back. Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852. This book, The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published in 1854. So two years after Harriet Beecher Stowe writes her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, she is inundated with speculation and rumors. Everyone seems to claim they knew Uncle Tom and that they knew Simon Legree. So of all the characters from the book, and there are many, people come out of the woodwork to swear they knew Simon Legree. And they start, they want to know who he really is. So she writes this book. It's 508 pages. So this is the longest bibliography you're ever going to find. And she actually publishes this with the original facts and documentations upon which the story is founded. So the entire book, is her source information and her words saying, hey everybody, this is where I got the book from. It is a work of fiction and I've based it on some real things and some real events. So she actually says, Uncle Tom himself is based on Reverend jo Josiah Henson. Now, the Reverend Henson writes a book originally called The Life of Josiah Henson, formerly a slave, now an inhabitant of Canada, as narrated by himself. So that's his original title. It's published in 1849. About 1850, Stowe actually asked to meet with him after reading his book, and they meet for a very long time and talk, and she's really impressed with Henson and his story, and she bases Uncle Tom off of Josiah Henson. Of course he doesn't die but he has very similar i won't give it away you should read his book but he has a very similar life story and travels as our fictional uncle tom so henson's a little thrown out because harry beecher stowe becomes this huge selling author uh, of course he doesn't uh, most people have never heard of him but stowe becomes literarily famous and she wants to make amends a little bit, she actually helps him republish his story in 1876 as Uncle Tom's story of his life, and she writes the foreword for the book. So Henson himself actually go, goes on to uh, do great things. He starts a colony or a town in Canada, um, has lots of patents, uh, becomes a very successful farmer, um, lumber person, that sort of thing, and starts a fantastic community. There is still a um, park in Canada called Uncle Tom's, uh, and it has his property, his house, uh, things like that, uh, still there on exhibit you can visit. So also, according to Harriet Beecher Stowe, in her book, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, she says that she creates Simon Legree from first-hand accounts that she reads in the book, American Slavery As It Is. And this book was published in 1839, and this is testimony of a thousand witnesses. So this is a thousand people telling what the South is really like, what plantation life is really like, what is slavery really like in America. Stowe reads this, and she creates Simon Legree from these first-hand accounts. So, in reality, if we think about it, we think about this book where it's so heavily talked about, we think about McAlpin, we think about um, Meredith Calhoun, so many people claim to have known Simon Legree that it really makes us wonder you know, in po modern popular myth, we think of, well, there weren't that many cruel slave owners. And it seems like liter literature is uh, going to disprove that, that there were so many 
cruel slave owners that beat and murdered their slaves that people are literally coming out of the woodwork to claim that they were this literary character. So I think that's another thing that we really should look at is, you know, that this was much more common than we want to believe. This is much more common than we want to consider now as we sort of um, romanticize this, where the reality is there were a lot uh, of Simon Legree's, a whole lot. So then the question becomes, as we look back to our original um, line from Facebook, where the person says that his mother told him stories and people were taking pictures. So what building was that? Uh, I have a book, Plantation Homes of Louisiana, published in 1977, that says you can go to Little Eva Plantation and view Uncle Tom's cabin. So where did that building come from? If we know the original one's lost, where does this building come from? So more research is to be done on this, but essentially in a nutshell, the original buildings, the big house, um, they, they fall in on them on themselves. The plantation goes into disrepair, the buildings collapse. Uh, we call that demolition by neglect. And in the 1950s, the property is purchased by Sterling Evans out of Texas. Evans renames the land Little Eva Plantation, and he builds Uncle Tom's Cabin. So he builds a replica on the property for people to come view and for people to come tour. And the, this is the cabin that people remember in the 1960s and in the 70s um, coming and visiting and claiming that that was the original Uncle Tom's Cabin. So he built it in the 1960s. Uh, and he also marks Uncle Tom's grave. So he puts a bronze plaque up saying this is uh, where Uncle Tom himself is buried. And he tries to get the Louisiana State Parks to take the land in 1960. Um, their letter, which is in the Cammie Henry collection, essentially says, uh, no thank you, we have zero interest because there's nothing historically uh, accurate or viable on this property. These are all recreations that you've made within the last few years. Uh, he then sells it in 1977, and now it's a very successful pecan plantation called Little Eva Plantation, and all of the buildings and sort of the, um, you know, the fake uh, plaques and all that are, are no longer there. It's a legitimate um, pecan plantation now. So that wraps it up. Um, so I hope that got you thinking about sort of the urban legend of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, as we know now, it is not based in Natchitoches. Uh, I apologize to anyone, uh, but the, the literary facts speak for themselves uh, that it is that Simon Legree was not here, but a construct of countless, countless cruel slave owners. Um, if you follow the QR code here, uh, it will take you to our project about the docu digital documentation of slave cabins. If you know of any, please contact us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And in closing, I want to give a special thanks to Mary Lynn Warnett, the head archivist of the Cammie G. Henry Research Center, and Sharon Wolf, the assistant archivist, uh, for all their help helping me find numerous articles and letters that are in the uh, Cammie Henry Research Center. So I hope this was informative and uh, I look forward to hearing from you.